Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to the programming language first impression series, the series in which we take a look at a programming language for about an hour or so and just get an introduction, understand the ecosystem and just a little bit about how that programming language might help us think a little bit differently. Now today I've got a really exciting programming language, probably the most requested as far as the comments have gone leading up to this point so far. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at our programming language today, which is the Odin programming language. So of course, if you search Odin, you're going to get to Odin has many names, uh, different mythologies, different beliefs about who Odin was, but we're going to be looking at the Odin language here. So if you type in Odin Lang, you will get the result for the Odin programming language. And let's just go ahead and take a look around here. Now, this is probably one of the newer programming languages here. I'm going to try to see if there's even a uh, Wikipedia for Odin Lang. Um, there might not even be here. Uh, let's see here. There is basically this everybody wiki page. I'll go ahead and open that up because I like to look at uh, some other different types of uh, resources beyond the actual programming language website here. Um, and let's see here. Well, I'm going to actually open up this one as well because Ginger Bill is the person who makes it. We'll find that out. Let's see what this um, wiki shows up here. Uh, and this is everybodywiki.com. So, you know, not uh, Wikipedia. But again, giving us a little bit of the basics about the language, again, known as Odin Lang, general purpose programming language. This is a compiled language, statically typed, and it is importantly a systems programming language. So that's what we're going to find out here. I've heard a lot. I've seen some talks on Odin language, but again, I've never used it, not until today. So um, what's kind of interesting is if we look at this uh, bullet here, and I'll read it off for you. Uh, the programming language here comes with several bindings for graphics APIs like OpenGL, DirectX, SDL, the Simple Direct Media Layer, and Vulkan. Uh, so those of you who watch this channel or maybe have seen some of my other content know that I talk about these things, graphics, game development, and so on. So interesting that Odin might be quite aligned with some of the things that we do on this channel, as well as, well, for game programmers, folks building multimedia applications, and so on. Uh, so this language, as far as it goes, is about seven years old since July of 2016. So again, relatively super new as far as a programming language is concerned. Uh, I don't really consider programming languages, you know, kind of matured until they're really at that like 20 year mark. It really is kind of remarkable uh, for a piece of software, but it takes a lot of stability, features, uh, support, community, and so on to grow a language. And we've looked at different languages that sort of bootstrap, strap, excuse me, on top of um, different infrastructures like LLVM and so on, or compilers that are built from the ground up. So these are some of the things and reasons it takes time. So again, this is a relatively uh, young language here. Now, as I mentioned briefly, a uh, ginger bill is the developer uh, of this programming language. I'm not quite sure if it's him working independently on it or who's contributing uh, otherwise. Uh, but it is worth noting uh, about this notable software here, Embergen, which we will see on the website. And I have seen these folks uh, talk about it, uh, which is a really cool example of some of the things you can do with Odin. Uh, and I think Gingerbell maybe contracts or works with Embergen or, um, you know, they might be also supporting the development. So uh, anyways, let's go ahead and look at um, some of the documentation here. So the, here is uh, Gingerbell's website. Just kind of curious to see um, some of his stuff here uh yeah so he's gonna have a lot of odin demos and various things here maybe we'll open this up here um just uh, i'm gonna pause it here for a moment looks like there's a nice stream here but um just in case other folks want to check this out now this video here is seven years old uh which is kind of cool let's fast forward to the demo maybe here uh just to the language here i wonder if it's got some maybe graphic stuff maybe they're just going through the language that's fine too uh let's see here i think um, what's kind of cool about this, and one of the kind of cool things about the newer language, I'll say, we're not going to watch all this, but, you know, to actually be able to learn from the creator who's teaching, you know, how stuff should work, what he thought about, um, as far as maybe the design decisions, that's actually pretty valuable. So again, I'll leave that uh, to Ginger Bill. You can watch that or check out that video, but that's kind of cool just to know that that stuff uh, exists around here. Uh, we've got some of his games here too, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> uh, and to see that some of them are actually done in Odin as well. Um, so anyways, uh, that's kind of cool uh, to know a little bit about the creator here. Let's just hop into the main uh, programming language, otherwise uh, the page here, the Odin language here. So data-oriented language for sane software development. Very cool. Now, of course, the data-oriented paradigm is something that, um, you know, game developers especially think about because, well, really what we're doing with the 
computer is just transforming data, right, from input to an output. And again, games are something with a lot of mutable states, so you want to really think about what your data is doing, how to be efficient and different, uh, you know, basically how you're taking uh, advantage of your hardware, so things like memory hierarchies, you know, how much data can you fit in the cache and keep data in the cache and so on, principle of locality. Some of these different things are very important uh, to understand for performance. So uh, kind of interesting. I mean, this looks like a language, at least again, what I know of it, that's making a niche in performance oriented uh, places and specifically perhaps in gaming. So let's see here what they say. Programming done right here. Okay, cool. Uh, Odin's general purpose programming language with distinct Typing built for high performance modern systems and data oriented programming. Uh, Odin is the C alternative for the JIF programming. <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool here. You know, a lot of people really like C. You know, it's a simple language. Um, and in a way, that's one reason that I like it. I can teach you the basics of C. You know, I could teach you all the syntax of C in about two hours. Um, now, how to be a good programmer and to think as a C programmer, of course, takes longer time in practice. But, you know, the syntax of, of C can be learned relatively quickly. I, you know, I teach it an hour uh, or not an hour, but rather a three hour lecture um, at university on occasion. I'm um, just for the basics. And then, of course, you learn how to use it and build data structures. So um, it's interesting to see if Odin can sort of displace um, and that's that's sort of what's happening in some domains. Right. We're seeing these languages displace a little bit of areas of where C would be, you know, if Odin's niche is gaming or, you know, graphics applications and high performance stuff, it might displace there. Now, of course, Odin is a general purpose programming language, so I'm not going to make any claims quite yet as to, you know, it's good for this or anything, right? We're, we're not going to get that far here. Um, but let's just kind of get a feel for the language here. Um, let's see here. I mean, the, the syntax looks pretty reasonable here. Um, now this is kind of interesting. We've got this package here. So I wonder if this is scoped to this package here. And then we have a function that could be kind of interesting. Uh, we've got a for loop here, like a range based for loop here, uh, for token in program. I'm assuming this is a string. You've got emojis. So there must be like Unicode support and these types of things. Uh, and then an accumulator here, uh, with the Pascal, uh, assignment operator. Again, I love this. <laughs> I just think it's so much better. Uh, colon equals. I, I wish more programming languages actually use that. Um, but anyways, uh, let's see. And then we've got a format library. And this looks like pretty reasonable uh, stuff. So uh, hello, um, PE, okay. Array programming, okay. Uh, of course, now we're getting data oriented. So array programming uh, languages again working with data here. So we've got an array of three. Uh, I'm going to assume F32 is floats. Here they are. Uh, and B. Um, and okay, so this is kind of interesting here. So for C, the result, um, right, we're doing A times B. I'm assuming that's just going to do an element by element uh, multiplication and then an addition. Um, and then we've got E here, which is doing one plus. Um, interesting. Now this, I don't know what it's doing here. C minus D, if that's doing that per element. Uh, let's see if we look at this and again, become array programmers here. So A times B, one times five. Let's just do the first one. And then we've got a D, which is, uh, again, one plus five here. So that's going to give us six. So I've got, let's see, five minus six here, negative one, uh, divided by two is going to be negative one half. And then we just add one to it. Okay. So pretty good. Uh, actually, yeah, that's uh, 0 0.5. So we can confirm that is true here. You can probably confirm that faster than I did. It's here. <laughs> um, uh, out loud, but uh, pretty cool. So element wise um, operations, I mean, and, and what's kind of clean about this could be a few things here. Now, uh, of course, you could just overload the operators for this in a language like C++, right? You derive those um, operations here. You'd build some like fundamental type here or something like an integer uh, or a vec type, excuse me, um, that operates element wise on each uh, element here. Um, and uh, that's pretty neat here. Uh, but again, assuming this is done with like array programming, maybe there's other interesting operations. There's different ways to optimize some of these things with like SIMD operations, or maybe you could even dip into the GPU. I think eventually we'll get to the point where folks are going to be able to actually take advantage of their GPUs <laughs> for some of these operations, um, you know, or there will be more APIs getting into standard libraries for that type of thing. 
Um, but that's kind of cool here. Um, just seeing how they're kind of setting that up here. I mean, swizzle is something that's a common like SIMD operation here. Um, where basically you're taking in this array of three floats here and just kind of saying, okay, one is now in position two. So that would be at the end here. Um, and then let's see, two stays in the same place here at the you know first index, and then three would go at the front here. So right, you can see three, two, one here. Uh, so you know effectively we've reversed this, <laughs> I suppose here. Uh, but that's that's the swizzle operation. Again, if you've done OpenGL stuff, if you're watching this channel, right? We have different ways to swizzle um, in the shading languages, but we could do a gen more general swizzle uh, operation here. So some cool stuff here uh, that we've got here. Now distinct that looks like a new keyword. Um, anyways, uh, let's see, what else do we got here? So it looks like there's some interesting, like, you know, vector and linear algebra stuff built in here. Again, if you're going to be a data oriented language for games, uh, this all seems like reasonable stuff here. Uh, let's see SOA types. I'm going to assume that's structure of array types. Uh, so, okay, here's a, uh, structure of, let's see, X, Y, Z. So representing some, uh, vector here. Um, now, I mean, this is a little bit interesting. Does that mean that X is a vector, Y is a vector, and Z is a vector here? Vector three of structs. We've got to actually kind of think about this here. Uh, we got to see what this N colon colon two means. What's that? <laughs> Did I initialize something? Uh, so we'll have to kind of get a feel for this language. Maybe that's what it kind of looks like here. Maybe that's just like a constant. Um, I wonder if constants can be done at compile time, right? We've seen that in a lot of other uh, new languages here. Uh, but let's see. We've got this... Uh, I guess, I mean, this is creating a new type or something, a VEC3. Uh, yeah, we got to think about this a little bit here. Um, v, let's see, array of structures. I guess I'm just making an array of this structure here uh, with two of these vectors. Okay, yeah, that, that makes enough sense here. Let's try to see if they're like defining a new uh, type here. But I mean, well, I guess they are here. They're creating this uh, struct here called vector3. And then just creating two of them and then just, just assigning things as we would normally do in other uh, languages. Okay, so that seems pretty reasonable. Um, now, interestingly, though, wait, let's go ahead and scroll down here. Look, it looks like there's some sort of annotation here. And I'll have to make this text box a little bit bigger for you. <laughs> Sorry to keep moving around. We'll, we'll get into the language here uh, and download it and try it out here. But uh, is this like a... Hashtag SOA structure of arrays. Interesting. Um, we'll have to look at some documentation to see what that uh, does. But anyways, let's keep kind of moving along here. Context system. Interesting. There's an implicit value named context. Context variables local to each scope. Interesting. Okay, so we'll have to uh, make this bigger so you can actually read it here. Um, interesting. Okay, so we'll have to think about uh, what's going on here. Now, if a context is sort of like, um, let's see here, main purpose of the context system is ability to intercept uh, third party code and libraries, modify their functionality. Interesting. So we can modify a library allocates or log something. Uh, let's see, in C, it has macros. Okay. Uh, however, not so many libraries support this. Um, well, this is kind of interesting here. If I can. I'll have to think a little bit about this here. Um, yeah, I mean, I was thinking about creating a context for like a region of memory or like an allocator or something, which seems to be the use case here uh, to have like a region of memory where you could do something. I mean, this is kind of useful if you have, a, especially if you're bringing in a third party library, some other dependency, it would be kind of nice to kind of wrap it in a context and either give it a block of memory to work in. And then if it corrupts that memory or does something weird, because uh, again, you're not really responsible for you know, or I should say you're responsible for what the third party is, right? You call into its public API, but you can't really mitigate some of the risks, I suppose, of if there's a bug in their code or some sort of like heap corruption or something. Um, so this is kind of interesting if you can like just make, um, <laughs> this is, you know, what a fool please, uh, just make a context and sort of trap uh, a library in some sense. Um, or, or, you know, some other users third party call. I mean, this is kind of an interesting like thing for both safety and maybe efficiency, uh, tentatively, if they're using this as like a region based uh, allocator, uh, so some interesting stuff here. So, I mean, going to get a feel for the language here. We'll have to actually type it out to build some muscle memory here. Um, and I like that there is reflection here. 
uh, I don't know if this is compile time. I mean, this is a, a statically typed in compiled language, but I wonder if we're at least getting compile time reflection, maybe at runtime too. That would be uh, a big win here, right? This is something that, I mean, game developers, you end up building our own like, you know, dynamic runtime uh, reflection uh, <laughs> uh, systems, uh, right? Compile time reflection often, uh, more often we'll get in languages like C++. D has got uh, pretty good compile time reflection, um, relatively speaking. One of the reasons I like using D actually. Uh, but looks like Odin's got some stuff here. So, um, okay. So as far as Odin goes, there is a discord. So that's good. See the, you know, communities active. Obviously you've got the creator of the language, very active posting on YouTube and such. Um, let's read about some of the principles. Okay. So it's been designed for readability, scalability, orthogonality of concepts. Simplicity, uh, is complicated to get right. Clear is better than clever. hundred percent. You know, this is the big thing for developers um, these days and again we'll keep getting into the odin language here but um simplicity wins um especially in long term on code bases you know everybody's sort of got their showing off phase as i like to say including myself um <laughs> in which you like to do something complicated or clever um but you want you really want to tame complexity um and choose the simplest thing uh possible i would say uh, let's see, high performance. Okay, so we've got, yeah, low-level control, memory management, allocators. Um, and this is a language for systems programmers. I mean, they're already thinking about uh, things like structure of array data types and array programming, which is really cool. Um, we'll have to take a look at this here. Um, and what's kind of interesting here is I look at Odin. Uh, this is going to be a great uh, introduction for us, so we'll, we'll keep that page open here. Uh, the joy of programming. Yep, we love we love it because we like to solve problems. It's fun, um, and that's really what part of this series is about: exploring different languages, seeing where you might have fun. Uh, that's that's for you to answer. Uh, you know what language you're gonna like here. Uh, so, anyways, we'll go through the overview here. Uh, I want to start downloading Odin, though. Um, but while I'm doing that, uh, so let's go ahead and get a download going. Uh, let's see what packages there are available. I mean, this is available on GitHub. I'm I'm tempted to actually try to build this from source here. Let's see if I download it, uh, what that looks like. Um, let's see, the latest release we can try. We might have to do an older one too, um, just to see if it works here. But let's go ahead and just download here. Um, I'm also tempted, I'm very tempted to just build this from source. This looks like the type of language where, you know, you should do that. So uh, anyways... I'll get the GitHub ready just in case here. Um, and I mean, even look at this, you know, somebody <laughs> made an update here uh, as of uh, 13 hours ago. So pretty recent here. So let me open up uh, Odin here. Uh, let's see, open it in the terminal. Yeah, let's just do Odin. Okay, so I'm going to need to give myself some permissions to execute this. Executable. Uh, a couple errors here. Yeah, this is what I suspected here. Uh, I might need to download glib. Uh, see, now I wonder if I build this from source, if that's going to make a difference here. Um, I could download a uh, glib uh, C here. I wonder what version I have. I just upgraded my Ubuntu. Ah, darn, I've got uh, 2.31 and we need at least 2.3. 3.2, maybe 2.34 here. <laughs> so uh, two things. I want to actually try to build this from source and see if um, that makes a difference. Maybe it'll find my older uh, C library and just, you know, be happy with that. Uh, let's make a directory called... Uh, actually, let's just clone it here. Let's see if this um, works for us and we can go through it. Um, you know, building a language from source, I don't think we've... I'm trying to think if we've done that before. Usually we've just gotten a release here. Uh, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but it's good for us to do here. Uh, let's see. Getting started. Let's see. Nightly builds. Uh, let's see about... Uh, well, we might just also download an older version, too. Uh, oh, warning. Yeah, the, the Odin compiler is still in development. Yeah, fair enough. So um, that's why I suspected, you know, some of these younger languages are going to be sort of interesting for uh you know for us to actually compile uh from scratch here uh let's see clang is what's needed here okay so we could install clang in lvm 11. uh let's see that's taking uh some time to download um 
I'll open up another terminal here. Uh, let's see what I've got here. Uh, I don't know. What are my L LD and then let's see version. What LLVM tools do I have here? Yes, everything. Uh, oh, it looks like I do have 15 and 10. I wonder what it's going to find here. LLVM opt opt repo. Let's see. Uh, which one here? Okay, version nine here. Okay, so we might have to update this here. See the app get install LLVM. 11 let's at least get 11 here uh i think that should be okay of course let's get that started uh, and then i'll also download clang here so let's cd into odin here uh yeah i suspect if i run make here it's gonna complain until we uh get llvm set up here uh let's keep looking at the language here Again, I'll try to build it from source. Otherwise, I'll download glibc and we'll also uh, try to upgrade that. That's that's not a problem or shouldn't be a problem. Uh, hopefully, I don't mess up my system or something. <laughs> Just upgrade uh, Ubuntu uh, 20 from 18, which is long overdue uh, on this desktop machine. I've been using 22 on my laptop. Uh, but anyways, uh, let's see here. Linux users. Okay, let's see here. Uh, make sure you have LLVM and Clang installed. Okay, so we're going to do that. Um, I'll do Clang next, just to make sure we have at least version 11, which is the, uh, well, lowest, oh, 11.1. .1. Okay, so we'll make sure, maybe we should do 12 or something, but yeah, I'll, I'll put in 11. <laughs> we'll see what happens here. Uh, but then otherwise, let's see here. Navigate to the Odin directory and use make, and you should have a newly, freshly, uh, fresh Odin compiler. Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and see how our progress is there. Looks like it uh, set up here. LLVM. Uh, let's see here. Do I see 11s here? I do. Okay. Which uh, LLVM C. Let's see which version it's defaulted to. Still version 9 here. Maybe it'll find 11. Uh, sudo apt git install. Playing 11. Is that it? That'll do the trick. And then let's go ahead and uh, give that a few moments to install here. Yeah, libclang11. We might have to update uh, which version's being used by default. Uh, so we'll work on that as well. So we're getting a little bit of a Linux here. Uh, anyways, let's return to Odin here. And um, yeah, so this is the Embergen tool. Um, and I got to see some of these folks talk a, a little bit about Odin, which was pretty cool. Um, at a conference at one of the handmade conferences, um, and they're they're doing some really cool stuff. And they talked a little bit about the tools that they're doing and some of their uh, future work at the time, which I think has been released um, from Jenga FX. Um, I'll actually go to their website. I don't know if I can play this YouTube uh, video, but they're basically yeah, real time uh, volumetric fluid simulator. So like you can't get more performance intensive than that, um, in a way, <laughs> you know, that's a really good, uh, use case here. And yeah, they're building some of these other, um, procedural generation tools, but yeah, Ember gens, uh, the one I had seen here, um, let's learn more. Let's look at some cool stuff here. Um, I mean, this is pretty cool cause it's being used in a lot of games and movies and stuff. Um, and you can see, right. The quality is very good. Uh, you know, it's generating stuff in real time and then you can export out, you know, the, the sprite animation. Uh, so this is a pretty cool tool. I mean, this is an excellent, excellent, um, sort of, you know, tool to have to advocate for your language. Uh, I think it is important that languages get some sort of, you know, it, it's useful to have at least one company that's making money in your programming language to help sort of sell the language. I mean, I think that just kind of speaks to it uh, and it perhaps inspires others to adopt it. You know, it's a story you can always point to. Um, so kind of nice that Odin has that um, and, a, and a really impressive uh, project here. So, um, I, and I'm kind of curious the history as far as how they got involved or, um, you know, if um, Ginger Bell knew somebody at this company or, um, or they just discovered it or something. That would be probably an in interesting story here. 
uh yeah so anyways you can see all the the stuff here so cool to see some real products um in odin there um uh, and then again like i mentioned you know these folks are um going to conferences and stuff and kind of showing off this uh these different tools here so that's pretty cool here uh now there is a showcase here as well here so beyond embergen uh, i just noticed this the odin language server here uh, okay cool a language server for text editors very cool uh let's see spall yeah this is another project that i had seen a profiler uh, again so cool cool stuff uh to duel i believe is how that pronounces the to-do editor um this is pretty sleek here i don't know if it has an animation um there we go here so you can see like different to-do lists and stuff um so yeah this is pretty pretty cool stuff yeah this not that it's kind of fun here power mode yeah <laughs> Uh, so anyways, a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff. Some of this is from like the handmade community, um, which is pretty neat here. Yeah, here's a look at Spall in action, a profiler. So again, cool stuff. Um, you know, you, you see a few of these applications and then, you know, you see that, yeah, it's a general purpose programming language. You can do anything in it. So that's kind of cool here. Uh, let's see what's going on in the news. Oh, they got a newsletter. That's really cool. I actually really like this. I want more programming languages to do this stuff. Um, some some do some don't but just to have like a, a cool newsletter um you know showcasing what the community is doing um newsletters conferences these are the types of things again i try to look for in programming languages um you know kind of keeps things exciting it's a good way to archive information uh great for new learners to language uh, so this is kind of cool here uh, oh they've got different categories here uh oh cool someone's working on PlayStation one emulator here. So, you know, all, all kinds of cool stuff, people building games, graphic stuff. Uh, what's this here? Basic software render stretcher. That's cool. Yeah. No Vulcan. Yeah. All, all kinds of cool stuff. I mean, this is quite a lot here. Um, I don't know who is doing this, but, um, you know, if we can link, ah, I see it does have the, uh, some handles to the, these users here. Um, pretty active community. I mean, to see all these different projects here, uh, maybe they're grabbing them on, you know, GitHub or something, but um, that's pretty cool here. So let's see what's been going on in the last few weeks here. Um, let's see. Oh, there's some other uh, YouTubers here working on stuff. Yeah, Handmade Seattle. Um, yeah, okay, cool. There was a, a chat here with them. So I'll have to watch this later and learn a little bit about, um, you know, some of the, the history of the language and so on um let's see what else they got here orca no, is this is an svg no this is a web assembly uh let's see apps oh cool so kind of interesting i mean i'm just gonna look at this stuff here um looks like i guess you can ex export uh web assembly or wasm uh code to odin which is pretty cool here uh let's see what else we got here got a community showcase yeah, this is all pretty cool stuff here. Again, just kind of scrolling through it. Uh, I, I love seeing some of these demos and kind of from creative communities. Even like little ideas can inspire sometimes. Uh, okay, so some of these are like progress updates uh, and the new stuff. Uh, mostly new stuff, it looks like, from different folks here. So again, pretty active community um, overall here. Um, okay, let's see how our install is doing so we can actually play around with the language a little bit. Uh, so we have, let's see, Clang, allegedly, uh, a version of it in LLVM. And then maybe we can just do make here and see what happens. Okay, so I found the LLVM uh, path here. Uh, and I already messed up. I want to do this in parallel here. Uh, let's see here. Oh, let's see. Uh, was that it? Uh, like, is it already working? Uh, okay, I think it's like running some demo here. Um okay was that it um wow that was probably uh plus plus points to the odin programming language uh let's do like make install okay no nothing i mean it's just they've got the binary that was the fastest make for a programming language i've ever seen uh, <laughs> so okay plus plus you know their performance claims uh might be like totally true <laughs> everything uh, and it built the demo and ran it so i mean like they tested it. I was like, what is this from the make file? <laughs> uh, this is pretty cool here um, from Odin here. So I'm kind of curious to just take a little bit more of a look at here. Uh, now, what is a process pro uh, proposal process here? Um, interesting here. 
Um, <laughs> um, let's see here. Proposal process. Okay, so for making language additions. This is something that I haven't talked about in a lot of different languages. I promise we're going to get to the actual, like, typing in some of the, the demos and stuff. Um, but there's so many interesting things I'm intrigued here. Um, and I want to talk about this a little bit just because, you know, we've looked at a lot of different programming languages. And, you know, oftentimes they are sort of born out of somebody's vision, right? Somebody was a C programmer and they said, we could do this better. Let's make Odin or whatever. Uh, or they were a Pascal programmer. And then it sort of evolved, you know, different languages evolve in different ways, right? Based off of what you've been using. Um, and oftentimes they'll start off as teams of one, two, three people, sometimes companies, but, you know, there's some sort of, you know, problem that you're trying to solve better. Uh, of course, sometimes it's just for fun and then it evolves. But what's kind of interesting is all programming languages evolve well i mean nobody <laughs> i mean as far as i i know you know any serious programming language that we've looked at here has been around for many years and it evolves over time you know and that's why it's worth sticking it out building some expertise in a language because you'll evolve with it it'll eventually get you know some of the features that you want um, and this is what it's about i mean in the actual uh, repository telling you about how the language evolution process takes place c plus plus does this the d language has uh, D improvement proposals or dips, uh, and Odin has, uh, this here. Um, so interestingly, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, benevolent, uh, dictator for life. I mean, this is kind of like, um, the Linux, like Linus Torvalds sort of has that, you know, power at the end of the day. Um, it's, it comes with pros and cons, right? You kind of want somebody who has a vision, um, in my opinion, to guide language development. Uh, but that said, you know, maybe there'll be other folks who come in here, make a bunch of proposals, and then they, you know, become part of that uh, core team or whatever. Um, so anyways, um, yeah, this is so early in development. Again, Seven's a really young for a programming language. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, but it looks like, you know, th there is a process here, which is kind of nice to see here. So um, yeah, kind of kind of cool here. Uh, you know, that just stuck out here. Um, but let's let's just type out some Odin code here. I mean, already here, um, we've got what looks like a pretty simple uh, build system here. Got a way to run our build. Uh, check here. Let's see, parses and type checks. That's kind of cool here because um, you probably want to do that. I mean, this is kind of useful. Obviously, you could just do this with a compiler, like build, right, if it doesn't compile. But this is kind of neat for... Um, for two reasons. One, if you're just doing, you know, some sort of, right, this could be your integration test, right, in GitHub, right? Check to make sure that your code parses, right? Don't ever submit broken code. <laughs> um, so that's kind of nice here. But I wonder if this is also part of the compiler infrastructure, meaning that they've separated out some of these stages here, which is kind of nice. Um, so then you could probably do interesting things um, as far as the compiler team goes with, you know, if you've got your parser, um and the lexer split up then you can build linting tools and these kind of things here so that's kind of kind of neat here uh let's see so so it looks like the, i mean there already are some some tools here uh stripping sel semicolons uh it looks like they've got tests built in docs uh version and a report prints information useful to reporting a bug okay cool um okay and then we've got a way to get help here so uh already liking this um let's see what's in the examples for i mean uh what is all here all experimental all main let's see what's in the demo i think that's what we ran here um so if i go back a few directories and i run odin uh, and run the demo let's see how do i do this can i just do build uh can i just do run how do i do this uh, I'm assuming I have to pass some files. Okay, it doesn't just grab them or whatever. Uh, demo, run. Uh, let's see. Oh, maybe Odin, run. There. Uh, okay, Odin, run, takes a package as its first argument. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah, that's, that's what I meant. Of course it was. <laughs> okay, so uh, some cool stuff already here. Uh, as I'm talking to myself here, uh, let me rewind here. Uh, right, so I type this in and it says, did you mean this? Oh, of course, you know, I totally know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, and it's teaching me here. That's really cool. Uh, so again, some some thoughts going in here. 
um, on the help system. I love that this stuff's built in here because, again, like a rookie like me here, um, you know, we want to know what's going on here. So, okay, we're running the demo code here, which is pretty cool. Uh, let's open it up. Let's kind of split things out here. Uh, and again, we could probably add Odin to path here. That's fine. Um, let's do the build, uh, demo, and file. Okay, cool. Uh, and that built it. Uh, and then I could just run it here. Okay, so cool. We can kind of iterate and so on. Uh, let's take a look at, uh, again, some of the stuff here. Oops, we don't want to look at the executable, but again, showing you it's a compiled language here. Uh, now, I don't have any syntax highlighting or anything uh, for Vim here, uh, but this is pretty cool here. I mean, this is our tutorial here. Uh, Odin's general purpose programming language. I kind of like this. Um, this is actually not a bad idea for programming languages. Again, um, right, again... I like reading a book. I like, you know, a series of structured tutorials. Obviously, if you're watching this, I like a series of YouTube videos. But sometimes it's nice to just put everything in a one file. It sort of reminds me of like the Vim um, like tutor where you just kind of go through it. Um, so this is kind of neat here to see everything. Um, yeah, this isn't a bad way to, to learn the language here. Um, so we can kind of learn about this. I'm going to actually go to the, through with the, um, the overview, though, that I open up in this other page here, just so I can type some stuff out here uh, and I'll teach us about building here so I don't have to be a rookie um, on camera so much <laughs> but uh, let's go ahead and just create like a, a hello file uh, I'm going to do it just in this you know in the build directory since uh, I don't care too much um, about you know um, you know I'll just uh, discard that file uh, afterwards but for simplicity let's just create a hello odin uh, file here just so I can run it here uh, hello okay just so I've got it there perfect okay let's go through this introduction here basic tutorial for us okay uh, so we're going to start with a modified version of the famous hello world program okay let's see what's modified about it um, okay so let's see it looks like we've got stuff in a package uh, we don't end things with semicolons here uh, which is kind of neat. I guess that's why we have that semi-colon uh, stripping program. You know, old habits are hard to get rid of. Uh, I still type out semicolons with the Python that I write, so uh, it totally makes sense. Uh, hello, PE. Okay. <laughs> oh, and there I go. One semicolon. Okay, we'll count them uh, as I do them here. Uh, so we got to save this. Oh, okay, here, here's what I want here. Odin, run, and then dot here. Uh, now, I might have another Odin file here. Oh, no, I guess not. Uh, run file compiles um, our Odin files that it finds, uh, assuming that we find one, like, entry point, which I'm going to, again, assume that's main. Um, and then, of course, we can use build. Okay, that makes sense here. Uh, Odin thinks in terms of a directory-based packages. Yep, sure. Uh, to tell to treat a single file as a standalone package, add file like so. Yep, that's pretty cool. Uh, now, this is one thing that the D programming language did nice with RDMD uh, that I think was nice. I wonder if Odin would do something similar where you can basically just run it like an interpreter. Uh, again, we'll have to, like, compare, um, you know, how long some of these things take. Um, like, this is fast enough, but I wonder if we have a, a big program, uh, what the compile time is here. Uh, and I'm probably looking at the, like, actual uh, real time here. Well, that's kind of interesting if it's doing something, uh, might be doing something in parallel there or using multiple cores. Uh, but anyways, uh, let's see, we got our comments slash slash. So C style, uh, variables here. Uh, let's see. So my integer variable colon and then type. And we're seeing this in a lot of other programming languages these days. I wonder if this style is just winning out. Um, it's possible. It's also easier to parse and it's also possible that it's, um, less confusing what the type is going to be. Uh, meaning, right, you have the classical C thing, right, where you do int x, y, um, and this is a pointer, and y ends up like an integer or something um, in, like, old C uh, code. <laughs> so um, maybe that helps uh, clear up some of these things here. Multi-line comments. Okay, we've got character literals. Uh, single or double quote. Uh, no, uh, single characters uh, get single quotes. That's fine. Um, raw st string literals with the back ticks. Okay, I like that. That's pretty clean. 
like the string. Okay, yeah, built in len, like, um, oops, uh, uh, broke our link there. Um, but like Python, yeah, so that seems uh, reasonable. Uh, okay, now this is cool. If the string passed to len as a compile time constant, the value from len will be compile time constant. Okay, so this is getting into cool stuff. Um, you know, pretty much every language, every modern language has to move in this direction, I think. Um, you know, even C with the recent C23 standard is adding like const expr and these types of things here. Um, right, we want to be able to do work at compile time uh, to save users time, right? And not rely on the compiler optimizer to, you know, do some of these uh, common sub expression, you know, elimination and those types of things are great. But again, you want to be able to do those at uh, compile time, more things like that, more computation, run algorithms, and so on. Uh, let's see, numbers. Okay, uh, I like this. You got the underscores so you can do uh, improve your readability. That's great. Binary literals, 0b, octal, hexadecimal, the standard things. Uh, let's see here. A float literal, but it would be represented as an integer without precision loss. Okay, interesting. Uh, an odin if number constant can be represented by a type without precision loss, it'll automatically be converted to that type. Okay. So I wonder if I, uh, let's just play around with this. Let's create our first variable X here. I'm going to assign it to 1.0 and then let's just print it out here. Uh, I'm so tempted to type a semicolon here, but okay. We get one here. Now if I assign X to 5.2, uh, does it truncate it? Uh, oh, it gives me an error. 5.2 is truncated to int. Got 5.2000. So that is a compile time error, it looks like. Um, so it looks like I can sort of mess up here. I mean, this is this is interesting for two reasons. Maybe you change the type here, but I like that, again, this is statically typed and it's not doing like a weird implicit conversion. I want an error here. I want to know something weird's happening and I need to cast this or something. Uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, good job. Uh, the compiler writers here. Um, okay, so we'll get rid of that here. Uh, and we'll just leave this as some like number here. Okay, so there we go. Um, okay, variable declarations declares a new variable for the current scope. Yeah, I like this. Um, again, this sort of reverse syntax. It's just super clear, like if these are going to be pointers or something. Um, now, this is kind of cool here. Uh, of course, yeah, we need this scope here. Um, I like this in like Python and stuff. Now again, um, okay, here we're getting to the assignment strategies because I want to know what the difference is between the colon equal. Uh, the assignment statement assigns a new value to variable location. Okay, uh, declares new variable x with type int and assigns a value to it. Assigns value. Okay, equals is the assignment operator. You can assign multiple types with it. Um, okay. Note, colon equals is two tokens. The colon equals. The following are all equivalent. Um, oh, interesting here. So I can do this here. Ah, I wonder if colon equals is just inferring the type. Default type for integer literal is an int. Uh, okay, so what if I just do y equals 27? Uh, no, okay. If I do colon equal, that's going to be... Um, I could get rid of the time thing. Uh, it will assign it. And I guess it's just inferring the type like auto or something. Um, that's kind of interesting here. I wonder how I check what the type is. Uh, but I still like that. I, I Again, I like this here. Um, and I like the x colon equals int here. Again, it's a little bit weird in a sense that, you know, other programming languages, again, if you're so used to C or whatever, you know, you have this style. Um, you know, that, just what it is. Um, let's see, constants uh, are entities, symbols, which have an assigned value. Constants value cannot be changed, okay? I wonder if that's what's kind of treating, you know, it's using colon, colon here. Uh, let's see, constant computations are possible. Uh, okay, interesting here. And I wonder if this happens, uh, okay, I guess there's a whole thing here, but um, I still have to think about how this is treated here. You know, if it's introducing this as a uh, constant, but this I think has more to do with the package that this procedure is part of main or something. Um, anyways, uh, packages. Okay, so we've got our packages that we can import. Uh, execution starts in the packages main procedure. Okay, that makes sense. 
Um, okay, let's see. Import statements. Yeah, we know about all this stuff here. We got format, got OS stuff. Yeah, it's all pretty cool. And then, you know, if you want to pick out a few specific things here, uh, you can pull out the foo. foo um, or, oh, I see. This is how you refer to uh, format as a different uh, thing here. So let's do that. Uh, foo. This should just be foo print line. Uh, oh, I guess, guess not. Uh, reference a package by a different name here. Foo co format. That's what I thought I did here. Um, and do we have to do it twice here? Let's see here. If I import it and then sort of like rename it. Ah, I see. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's fair enough. Two statements. Yeah, I guess it kind of makes it stand out more. Maybe this is more like parsable or something. Um, I have to think about that here. You'd want to look for like all of your imports that don't immediately follow space and quotation or something. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think some folks would probably want that to be one liner. Maybe that'll be a like language proposal thing you could do. Uh, but anyways, let's just, um, oh, maybe I just actually, maybe I just ran into that problem because I've got, uh, two statements there. Uh, yeah, that was just my mistake. Okay. Yeah. I was say that's a little bit silly to have that uh, to be two different lines, but kind of interesting actually that we stumbled upon that. Um, you can use the old stuff and transition it to you know the new stuff here. That's kind of neat here. Uh, exported names, okay. All declarations of package are exported by default. Yes, okay. But you can put the private attributes. Okay, so we've got private attributes here, um, or you can make things like private to the file. I wonder if this is how you control like private to like the class and so on. Um, that's kind of interesting. D also has this notion of like private uh, to the package, um, you know, beyond your like public protected and private, uh, you've got like package level um, protection and so on. Um, so that's kind of neat here. Uh, let's see here what we've got here. Yeah, let's get into some like basic loops and stuff, and then we'll kind of we'll kind of skip around. I want to see some of the the data oriented stuff here. Um, but I think we're getting a pretty good feel for this language here. Uh, you know, and this is, I guess, where the colon equal sequence um, or the assignment makes sense, right? I don't have to declare the type here. It makes our range-based loops very small and concise. So, you know, I like some of these just like little quality of life improvements that languages do here. Uh, yeah, let's print out some numbers here. Oops, what did I do to make some mistakes here? Uh, let's see here. Uh, syntax error expected. Curly brace, got an identifier. Let's see here. Oops. So error message is not too bad here. I mean, it's telling me a line 11 is messed up here. Uh, and it expected a semicolon. So yeah, basically fixed it. Uh, and let's get this back to format. <laughs> it's a little bit too weird here. There we go. Uh, so simple enough stuff. Uh, let's supposed to be going here. Uh, semicolons can be dropped. Okay, so yeah, it's giving us all the like quality of life improvements here. This is basically a while loop here. Yeah, it's kind of silly to have while and you know it could you could just have four uh, and get. I wonder it might just still have while loops anyways, but uh, range based loops. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I've got our strings. Um, now let's see here. Up oh, here's the range here dot dot equals nine dot dot less than 10. Okay, so that's actually kind of a nice, again, quality of uh, life sort of thing here. Uh, let's do this uh, range based for loop again. Uh, there we go. Uh, for uh, i in zero to less than or equal to 10 here. Okay. Um, let's see, is that allowed? Uh, let's see. I did equal. 10. Okay, that's allowed. Less than 10. I was gonna say, it'd be kind of neat if I could do less than or equal to um, just to see if it's inclusive or exclusive. But I guess, you know, you just make it 11 and that's also as clear <laughs> if you want 0 to 10. Uh, but that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, I wonder if they explored that and it just felt awkward or was weird to parse. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's kind of cool here. Uh, let's see. Oh, I, I guess that's just what the equals is here. Inclusive or exclusive. Okay, exactly what was going on. We just ran that and didn't think about it. Um, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, one symbol to type. Um, 
you know, that, that makes enough sense here. Um, okay, certain built-in types can be iterated over. Uh, yeah, let's create a string here. Again, we could just infer uh, name Mike for star in name. Something like this here. Let's try that. Yeah, I mean, it's a good sign here. Um, let's get all this on one uh, line here. If I'm able to just, like, look at this loop here and be like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to try this thing and it works, uh, that's a good sign for a programming language, right? The intuition. Um, obviously, I've been looking at a lot of different programming languages, but, you know, this is pretty clean here. I like this here. Uh, it looks like they've got slices, dynamic arrays, maps, some built-in data structures. That's pretty cool here. Um, so let's keep moving on here. Oh, and they've got other nice stuff here. Uh, so you can pass in a second index value. Yeah, D has this. I really like this. Good quality of life uh, improvement here. Uh, Odin, impressive language. You know, as far as a systems programming language goes here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, iterated values cannot be copied or written to. The following idiom is useful. For iterating over a container in a by reference uh, manner. Okay, what's this mean here? Uh, I guess we got to look at slices and like arrays and stuff here. Um, oh, interesting. They have little special directives uh, that they're adding in here. That's kind of interesting. Uh, I wonder if this is just because it's more of an array based language here. Let's actually see. So can I iterate through my name backwards now? <clears throat> um, yes, I can. E-K-I-M. So this is interesting here. Um, you know, a lot of different programming languages have sort of a, you know, mechanism for either ranges. C++ has ranges and iterate ranges now on C++20 and iterators. Uh, D has really good range, uh, you know, support. Um, and in other languages, we've seen different things. I mean, this is pretty explicit for what you're trying to do here. Um, I wonder what other, let's see if I click on this little hashtag mark here um, for reverse iteration here. I wonder if there's other, we'll have to look at this. I mean, if there's other things that you can do here, the, the obvious one that you could think of is, you know, you might want to make this like hash uh, or the pound symbol or hashtag <laughs> uh, parallel or something and, and think about those as different like modifiers. So again, there could be some interesting stuff. Maybe that's already built in um, again. Uh, you know, maybe we'll discover some of this here or, and maybe you folks can comment, you know, if you find these other things here, uh, if statement here. Uh, okay. Yeah. Standard stuff here. Uh, do not need to be surrounded by parentheses, but braces or do are required. Oh, interesting. Um, but braces. Oh, okay. Or if you have a, a do uh, statement. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, I like that braces are required. I, one of my pet peeves in, uh, C code again, right? Since this is improving on C, I can complain about it is when folks do like, if, you know, one, you know, something like that. And then they come, you know, uh, print F, you know, something here. This is really code that trips me up right <laughs> so i always put the curly braces um, i think it's an error not to have them you know this sort of single line thing i understand why it was there historically uh so it's not a knock on the language uh it made sense as far as you know saving data stored in a text file and it's common and, and it does show some structure but um i like the curly braces um you know it help, helps show the scope as well um if you modify the code and so on it's it's just useful um okay let's see what else we got here um if statement can start with an initial statement to execute before the condition oh that's interesting yeah uh see this occasionally in some languages i mean you can do this in in most languages um i think it'll follow these rules um so it's just kind of interesting that you can very concisely capture um right what you want to do here I mean, this is like what other languages do when you like write a Lambda, for instance, right? You might want to like write a quick little function. That's what this kind of feels like, like just retrieve a result here uh, and based on the result, do something, right? And you can sort of embed that um, in one statement here, right? It's, it's very clear 
what the scope of this is, right? Where you're using this data. So that's kind of nice here. Odin's got a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm quite impressed. I didn't know what to expect uh, from this language here. Um, you know, we're 54 minutes into it or whatever. We'll, we'll just kind of keep going here because uh, I want to see more. I mean, even these, these little things are really nice here. Uh, let's see here. Odin architecture, switch statements. Okay, I'm gonna go through these. I mean, I mean, overall, I'm impressed with the little quality of improvement things, like from the little, you know, range syntax and so on. Um, you know, oh, partial switch with enum values. There's a lot of really neat stuff here. We might have to do like, again, um, I'll probably at some point ask folks, you know, what they want for like part two. Um, <laughs> some of these series, we're gonna have to have like a vote or something uh, to figure out. Uh, which languages we should look at more, but you know, this is kind of interesting here. Partial switch here. Um, I guess that's just telling us, okay, let's actually try this out because I'm curious if, if I create an enum here, uh, again with these values here. So I've got foo, okay, enum, uh, a, a, b, c, d. I'm just gonna do it on the same line. Uh, and then I want to do, okay, assign this variable f to uh, A, so something within this enum here called foo. And then I want to switch on F. Uh, let's do, okay, case dot A. Uh, yeah, let's just kind of copy what they have here. Print line A. Uh, okay, and let's do empty case. Actually, let's just leave it here, A, B, C. I wonder if it's going to give me a warning here. Uh, other than the errors I've made, of course. <laughs> uh, let's see. I added semicolons, didn't I? Okay. So get rid of the semicolons. Uh, and now it's complaining at line 14. Oh, I typed in Swift. Uh-oh. Switch. There we go. Uh, error. Okay. Perfect. Unhandled case D. So again, uh, again, another thing I like in programming languages, right? Uh, if I miss a case, I want to know about it, right? Um, now, if I handle the default case, what's it going to do for me? Uh, case here. Format, print line. Yeah, just well, let's use a single character. See if print line's overloaded. Uh, unhandled switch still. Okay, that's cool. So now if I uh, amend this with partial, I wonder that's going to work here. Okay. So that's kind of interesting. Again, I like this because it's really quick for me to grab for these different cases here or if i'm just implementing something or maybe trying out an idea this could be useful you you know in practice you probably want to go fill this out and maybe you know if you're really missing one of these assertions uh or not uh assertions but one of these cases like like have an assertion or something <laughs> so when you're developing um you're sort of warned about that but i mean the partial kind of gives you a, a tool for that so that's kind of interesting here and a lot of a lot of neat ideas here. Uh, let's see, union types. Okay, these are kind of interesting here. Uh, int bool. Okay, fair enough. And then I can switch on that, uh, or have a partial switch. Okay, so I see why this makes sense. Yep, the first statement. We've seen these in Go. In uh, D, we have scope statement. Um, so I like this. Right, this gives me RAI um, capabilities here. Uh, I can defer an entire block too. Oh, or I can defer if a condition is true. Uh, that's new here. Um, this is pretty cool. This is sane software development. Uh, <laughs> okay, a real world use case for uh, defer might be something like the following. Yeah, you open a file. Uh, if there's an error, handle the error, and then you close it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can it, the C++ destructor, however the error handling is in the basic flow. Uh, Okay, differs from goes defer, which is function exit uh, and relies on a closure stack system. Interesting. So that's like a little implementation detail. We'll have to watch like one of the Odin videos or something <laughs> to understand exactly what's going on there. Um, so that's kind of neat here. Uh, yeah, we've seen the win statement uh, a few times here. It's like the if, but some differences. Um, must be a constant expression. And it's a compile time construct. Okay, cool. So, I mean, that sort of answers my question earlier about, you know, handling stuff at compile time. It looks like there is some 
Um, again, a lot of thought going into that here. Um, okay, let's let's look at this for a moment. If we look at how much of the scroll bar we've gone through, like just a tiny bit. So again, bravo for the uh, documentation here. I'm gonna you know go through some of this pretty quick. Um, you know, uh, let's see, multiple return time, oh, multiple results. Uh, procedure and owner can return any number of results, for example. Yeah, I guess they have tuple support or something. Um, I wonder how this, I wonder how to get that type information. Again, there is reflection, so we can look at these things. Um, Bravo on, well, now we're just getting into the types here. I mean, you can already see, I mean, we're just getting into the interesting stuff here, but they've got like a, a quaternion numbers here, uh, integers, floating point, any in specific numbers. Okay, they've got a way to interface with C strings, raw pointer. I actually like that it's typed out here. Uh, and return runtime information. Okay. Uh, type ID. Let's let's do it here. Uh, format, print line, type ID. Let's see, do I just wrap it? Something like that. Uh, can I cast? Okay, I don't know what I did here. <laughs> type ID. Why? Well, I don't know how to use that yet, but we'll figure it out here. I was, I was curious about that. Um, here, type ID. There must be a way to like print it out. Oh, type ID of. Okay. Oh, interesting. I I, I bet um, type ID is just like a type information object or something. Oh, what have I done? Let's see. Type ID of. Maybe I can't print it out. Expected a type or type ID of. Okay, good. So I can assign it. How do I print it out here? Let's see. This is something I do all the time here. Uh, let's see here. Um, all right. Well, maybe have to uh, hold off on that. <laughs> Get back to our, our spot here. All right, we're at the hour mark here, um, which is about where I want to end these, but I'm going to kind of keep flipping through these. Uh, we do have type conversion. It's got to be explicit. That's great. Uh, oh, it does have uh, type inference here. Oh, interesting, interesting. Um, okay, expression converts the value. Okay, or with a type inference, it'll try. Okay, got the casting operator. Yeah, I like the explicit cast here. Um, now I wonder if this is happening statically, like if this is a static cast or something, and then this is a, a runtime, uh, but has the same. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if that's the the case here. Uh, transmutate uh, or transmute operator is a bit cast conversion between two objects. Yeah, this is like a raw cast. Okay, but again, I like. Um, I mean, I wonder. Um, yeah, it's a little bit more of an accurate description of the name here, which which seems reasonable. Uh, untype types. Okay, and get your auto cast. Okay, so lots of different casts. I mean, this sort of makes sense because um, oftentimes when you're working in these sort of data oriented languages, sometimes, I mean, you're reading in streams of bits, writing out to binary bits, serializing data. So you, you need some operations to be able to, you need to be able to cast your data, right? Um, which is, you know, fine. Uh, so it looks like it's got some different tools there. Uh, printing. Let's see here. Okay, we got to scroll through some of this. Um, just to give you, uh, I'm going to see if there's anything. I mean, this is a really nice guide here. Like, I mean, it's talking about the floating point operators, overload, uh, things, uh, that you have to worry about the different cases. Uh, and here we're getting into the array programming. So we spent some time on this. Um, looks like we get slices again, which, which is really neat. Let's see. Slices look similar to arrays. However, their length is not known at compile time. Okay, yeah, in practice, slices are much more common than arrays. Yeah, again, when you work in a language that has slices, again, like in uh, D, uh, again, which I, you know, the language I use most that has this capability, you you kind of miss working in a language um, otherwise. <laughs> um, and I'm assuming a slice here, it's got to be an easy way to maybe like duplicate them or something if you actually want a copy of the slice. Uh, but yeah, internally, a slice uh, stores a pointer to the data and the integer to store the length. I mean, these are fat pointers in some languages or smart. Uh, uh, fat pointer is probably the right word for this, but um, that's the right thing to do. Um, span in C++ is a similar idea here. Um, okay, you've got your dynamic arrays built in. Okay, you just make them dynamic. 
You've got some append operations and functions. Okay, there are built-in uh, types here. Uh, inject and then assign. Yeah, I like these. Uh, a little bit different conventions on their uh, standard library here, uh, but some built-in types here. Okay, so again, we could spend hours doing this. Like this deserves its own like full series. We've got map data types here. Sorry, I'm scrolling through this a little bit fast. I just want to see some of the more interesting stuff. Uh, the different data types. Okay, so we did look at a little bit of this here. Uh, I mean, this is kind of cool. I mean, stuff we can't skip uh, talking about. Matrix, built-in type here. Again, why more languages don't have at least a basic linear algebra, you know, standard library <laughs> with three by three, you know, two by two, three by three, and four by four matrices. That would make game developers' life so easy to not have a dependency, just be able to include something. So I like that this is built in. We've seen a few languages that, of course, have this built in, you know, languages like R and stuff. But um, in this way, Odin kind of stands out in, um, you know, systems programming languages that have this type here. Uh, I think Free Pascal has it somewhere in its standard library. I actually found the a matrix type, which is pretty cool. Uh, but I'd like to see this more often in um, different languages. I, I think it'd be a competitive advantage. Uh, I, I know you could build your own library, but why not give folks one? To start with um, that you can optimize and, and so on you know with all the uh, interesting use cases that we have in machine learning and, and computer graphics um, okay yeah so they're giving us a bunch of different uh, the common uh, operations here could be in the determinants and so on using statements for the aliases okay so again I'm kind of flying through this in, in part just for my own uh, knowledge here okay allocators yeah this is the stuff that we'll really have to kind of think through here um and can we call into like c code is that what i'm seeing here i don't want to do this um review too short but i think we've got a really good uh feeling for this um and i loved how easy it was to just build the latest version that's fantastic um you know it's it's rare i could say that's the best way to run a programming language but i just at least on Linux, it was really simple. Uh, you saw what I did. <laughs> uh, okay, we got different uh, attributes and stuff here. Uh, actually, this is pretty super important. D by default makes everything thread local, which I like. Um, you know, you've got shared and stuff, which I think is to sort of avoid that. But um, I I'm kind of curious what the um, concurrency models are here right if we got an array based language here um what it's doing here um so anyways let's open up this guide just a little bit here and let's look at the docs here frequently asked questions here as we kind of wrap things up here history of the project okay uh language began as a pascal clone interesting but changed quite quickly uh i try to create the c process c preprocessor uh, for C to augment and add new capabilities. That's actually an interesting way to go about uh, fiddling about and creating a language. <laughs> and then you kind of figure out, that's funny that he just decided he'll create a new language from scratch, right? Rather than augmenting C. Um, yeah, I can see the influences here. Uh, of course, um, you know, uh, yeah, Nicholas, the late Nicholas Fair, Rob Pike, you know, two, um, uh, you know, the top programming language folks here. Uh, definitely. Okay, here's the license. Third party library. Okay, there's a couple uh, libraries here. That's kind of good to know about here. Wow, quite a collection here. Uh, that's actually a nice uh, discovery here. Again, to see that, you know, you've got a pretty mature ecosystem here uh, for software development. Uh, what does it have to offer other, other languages? Okay, I feel like this should be on the front page. Um, maybe it is. Maybe I just missed it. Uh, the FAQ batteries include, okay. There's a little bit of a sales pitch here. Um, I mean, was there an FAQ? Yeah, I should add the FAQ here. Cause this is selling me more on Odin here. Uh, the allocators built in types, array programming, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so nice list. I mean, we got to see a few of these things. Uh, yeah, let's see the foreign system. I just want to see how easy it is to link in like C code here for an import. Uh, let's see, foreign lib. Can I just like call into C? This is something that I like about D. I think Zig, um, you know, has some mechanisms for this, um, for just loading in like C code. I wonder about building libraries with Odin. 
Um, that might be something interesting on the, the build process. Um, anyways, I mean, it's a, it's a work in progress language, but I mean, there's a lot to be quite excited about here. Um, I love that this is, you know, you know, all the whys here of the language, because you kind of wonder about that. And sometimes if you don't know the why of the language, um, you can misuse a feature or, you know, you end up just complaining or maybe it turns you off. But if you know about the rationale of why something was built the way it was, um, it makes you decide if, if you want to use a construct, like should you build your own map uh, or, or should you use, you know, the built in one here? Um, so anyways, this is great. Um, I'm quite impressed with the, the Odin programming language here. Um, it looks like there's ways to, you know, support the development too. So if you've been impressed, you know, take a look at that, um, check out some of the other, uh, channels, some of the other folks, their discord, uh, involved in the language. And, you know, just looking at Jenga FX obviously was an impressive tool, but, uh, the community, there's newsletters, there's lots going on with the Odin programming language. And it's obviously very under active development, which means that there's very likely more cool stuff to come, more stuff with the compiler. Um. I'd like to personally see what other cool stuff. I mean, if it's built on LLVM, I'm assuming I can target pretty much all the platforms uh, otherwise uh, available from LLVM. So maybe Android, iOS. I saw some stuff about Objective-C interface. There must be iOS applications going on um, at some level. Um, but yeah, otherwise, um, what more can I say? Very impressed. Wasn't sure exactly what we were getting into with Odin programming language, but it's very clean. I'm assuming like if you know C programming, you could get into Odin very easily. And it would offer a lot of quality of life improvements that we've seen in some of these languages. Starting from the beginning of this series, like Go, uh, with little things like defer statements, some of the compile time stuff that we're seeing in other languages, working with slices, built-in types, mathematical types, just a really neat language. Um, again, I can't... Um, you know, state this enough. I'm really impressed. I can see why this has been one of the most requested languages <laughs> so far of this series here. Um, so yeah, the data oriented language for sane software development, uh, looks like it. I'd be curious. Let me know in the comments below if you think we should do like another review. Uh, at some point I might do some follow-ups on these different languages we've been looking at and Odin's made itself a strong candidate for that. So share uh with the community feel free to share if there are things that i miss things that i should definitely know about when it comes to odin uh and i'll be very happy to read through your responses so anyways folks with that said thank you for your time and attention as we've done this programming language first impression might have been one of our longest ones here uh, but anyways thanks for your time and attention and i'll look forward to seeing you in the next one